Representative Joe Sestak, Democrat of Pennsylvania and a member of the Armed Services Committee, your thoughts on uh, the President's speech last night? It was a courageous speech. It was the right speech. We took the effort to make sure that through deliberate an approach that we were have an increase in our troop strength, but one that is primarily focused, as you just heard him, on our relationship with Pakistan. It's really no longer about Afghanistan. It's about the safe haven of Al Qaeda that sits in Pakistan. And this partnership with Pakistan, to where on one side of the border we can close off the Taliban from crossing into Afghanistan, as Pakistan does its job on the other side of the, side of the border, is so instrumental, indispensable to our security, because Pakistan is close to a failed state, a failed state that has nuclear weapons. And if those terrorists gain access to that and to the scientists that have knowledge and access to the radiological material, the cost in years to come will be much greater than the cost of winning this effort today. How, in your opinion, would you measure success of the U.S. military and the President's proposal in Afghanistan? Rob, that's a great question, because the one issue that I wish the President had stressed last night was what are the benchmarks to measure success and failure? To me, they are the following. We know that Al-Qaeda is a few hundred terrorists on the other side of the border. They're not in Afghanistan, and we know who their leaders are there. How well are we doing in decimating that number? Number two, how well is Pakistan doing in turning into a counterinsurgency force and moving from South Waziristan into North Waziristan? Third, how well are we doing in Afghanistan in leaving conditions behind that are inhospitable to Al Qaeda when we redeploy? The key here to me is not an over reliance or placing our security in the hands of the corrupt, inept central government of Afghanistan, as the President had in his speech, and I wish again this one had been brought more out, reliance upon local, provincial, governors, warlords, tribal chiefs, and actually with only 20,000 Taliban in Afghanistan and 70 percent of them there for a wage, not ideology, how do you wean them out? And those are the types of benchmarks that give the public an understanding if this strategy is or is not working. Former uh, Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf had this op-ed in this morning's Wall Street Journal under the title, The Afghan-Pakistan Solution. He writes, a military solution alone cannot guarantee success. Armies can only win sometimes and at best create an environment for the political process to work. At the end of the day, it is civilians, not soldiers, who have to take charge of their country. He's absolutely right. In the last year, I've met twice with President, former President Musharraf privately to listen to what his viewpoints were. Because he is a military man, as I was with 31 years in the military. And I also was on the ground, both in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, early in this conflict. I headed the Navy's anti-terrorism unit after 9-11. I believe what he says, militaries stop problems, they don't fix problems. And when I was on the ground for a short period of time there, at the beginning of Afghanistan, it was working well. We had brought in the forces that had put Al-Qaeda on the run, set up an edifice, a template of security by which the other elements of our power could then work. The power of economic assistance, educational assistance, because in the long term, to fix the illiteracy rate of women in Afghanistan, 98% of them are illiterate, and the 2% that are illiterate can just about write their name, would probably be one of the best things we could have done at that time to fix this global war of terror. But we did it on the cheap after we went into that tragic misadventure of Iraq, and that's the deal that was handed, the poor hand our president inherited. We're going to go to the phones, uh, take questions for Representative Joe Sefak, Democrat of Pennsylvania and member of the House Armed Services Committee. Our first call comes from Roaring Springs, Pennsylvania. David, you oppose the President's proposal. Yes, I do. I'd like to ask him if he's in favor of the draft. And a question I have for C-SPAN, if they would ask people when they call in if they are in favor of the draft to see if they would really support this war or not if the draft was initiated. David, and, why is the draft such an important issue to you? Uh, most of the people in the country aren't even talking about this war. The people, only the military families 
are the ones that really talk about it because they have something at stake. The rest of the country has nothing at stake. Representative. Boy, what a great question. One third of one percent of all families in America are directly involved in this war, the military families. And it's a tragedy that it took a tragedy at Fort Hood to highlight those military families. So thanks for what you said. I am supportive of national service. But when I joined up, there was a draft back in 1970 as I went into the military during the Vietnam War. But I believe today the draft wouldn't work for the military because these soldiers today they often have to have a year of training. They run nuclear aircraft carriers. They do sophisticated work. It isn't just a trigger puller. They do much more. So by the time you train them, you need several years to reap back the investment. So my belief is that, yes, there should be this obligation to public service. But let someone go to the America Corps and let those for two years, and let someone in the military do four or five years if that's what they opt to do for their chore. And that's the reason for the efficiency and effectiveness of a much more sophisticated military than when I went in, well, frankly, 35 or so years ago. Our next call comes from Queens, New York. Anthony supports the president's proposal. Hello. Hi, Go ahead. Anthony. Hello. Good morning, sir. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to... Uh, Thank C-SPAN for their um, coverage of this uh, of this uh, agenda, and also I am in support of the president. I would like to first answer the last caller's uh, statement and say I'm supportive also of military service, not the draft at this time, as the as your guest has mentioned. You know, because of the many sophisticated. Uh, features that we have in our military. I think this is a job, and our military servicemen do it well, and I commend them. I do commend the president, but I also would like to see C-SPAN have a maybe on both sides, because I do understand the supporters who are against the war. Yes. I am against war also, but in this time, I believe that we were attacked. And we must go into Afghanistan and finish the job that President Bush left undone. Um, Anthony, thank you for the overarching point here. Is I respect those who differ from the president or me on this issue, and I'm in supportive of the president. I, I've been fortunate, and I got to work in the White House with President Clinton as Director of Defense Policy, and I saw the enormity and the deliberateness by which commanders and chiefs presidents should take this approach to war. But I respect the other side as long as those that are doing it are doing it not out of political calculation, but because they believe it's in the best interest of our nation. I wish we had these discussions, like you just said, basically in my caucus and with the other side of the other party and throughout America. That type of discourse bodes us best. You mentioned the caucus and uh, in the Wall Street Journal this morning, this uh, headline, critics from across the political spectrum, or critics from across the spectrum rip the plan. How will you press forward and uh, the, the president's proposal in the House so that uh, eventually the, the uh, funds, which are going to have to come from the Appropriations Committee, get uh, approved to, in order to uh, support the president's proposal? Today's the start, right here. And I hope to speak up on the caucus. And in fact, uh, I have great respect for our caucus, but I honestly have believed that in the past months this should have been a topic, not infrequently, in our caucus. And unfortunately, it hasn't been. Afghanistan, Pakistan, somehow after March got put on a back burner. I think it should have been on the front burner because it was very uh, obvious months ago that things were still spiraling downward. But I will continue to do as I'm leaving. You know, I had two interviews before this. I finished my last interview at midnight last night, and I started, you know, first at six. I'll continue and to speak in the caucus. Look, I respect those that differ. But when you weigh the cost and the benefits, and trying to withdraw and deal with this at a larger, farther away distance, when I went into Afghanistan the first time, I met with General. Uh, Hayden, head of the National Security Agency, before I went in for the mission I had to do. And I never forgot what he told me. He said, Joe, General Franks was running this operation in Afghanistan and keeps telling me, give me some actionable intelligence. I keep telling him, give me some action, I'll give you some intelligence. 
In short, you need some boots on the ground to move the terrorists and make them make a mistake so we can pick it up and then get them. And you can't do that from a distance. Speaking of the cost, uh, Appropriations Chairman da uh, David Ovi has suggested that maybe some sort of a war tax could be imposed in order to pay for this. Will you be able to sell this to fellow members of Congress and the people in your 7th district in Pennsylvania? Uh, I'm going to try. I may not I agree with the thought process of Dave. But I think overall the issue is how do you do this? One, bring it into the budget and either find programs that should be cut or have the courage to raise the revenues, as he said. But I'm not sure you just tax the more wealthy. What about the $79 billion that special interest oil companies have in tax loopholes that we might want to better have pay for this one? We shouldn't add it to the debt. And I agree with Dave Ovi's approach on that because it helps in the prioritization which Congress is supposed to do of how should we pay for it without indebting our future. Next call comes from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Barry opposes the president's proposal. Go ahead. Yes, I, I supported the president right up until he uh, started pandering more to the right wing. And I mean, if, if you're going to get voted in by one people, then, you know, go with them. You're supposed to leave with the person you came with. But, uh, see, I don't even think we should be in the Afghan war because right before the war started, back in taking people way back, back in 2001, there was like this big media frenzy of where the right-wingers syndicated all these people, Hannity and O'Reilly and all these people, the day before 9-11 happened. Go back and look in syndication, and you can actually look in the files and see that they were syndicated by the media the day before 9-11 happened, or the two days before. But the point is, is they knew something was going to happen so that they were pushing their media right-wing agenda and this president's just carrying on everything that the first president did. Uh, Barry, thanks for your opinion. Um, I was stationed at the Pentagon when 9-11 happened, and I took over the Navy's uh, anti-terrorism unit uh, right afterwards called Deep Blue. And I saw and had access to much material. I strongly believe that while the interagency did not coordinate information that seemed to be in disparate place, that what occurred was not orchestrated at 9-11. At we may differ on that, but I strongly believe that. Uh, what is important now, I think, is that the change that 9-11 brought about. Before 9-11, we liked what I call away games. We liked our wars over there. With 9-11, all of a sudden, we started having home games. We could be damaged here at home. I think this president has taken that into account. It's not whether it's right or left. He should be, and I believe he is making this, irregardless of political consequences, but for what's right for this nation. If we don't stop them there, they may end up damaging us here. I didn't agree with that in Iraq because we brought al-Qaeda to Iraq. But I know from having pursued those terrorists as head of the Navy's anti-terrorism unit, and then having command of my battle group and doing the strikes in there, that they leadership that damage us is there, and we must eradicate that threat. Our next call for Representative Joe Sestak comes from Fort Pierce, Florida. Mark supports the president. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sestak. Good morning, C-SPAN. Good morning, Mark. Uh, let me commend C-SPAN for uh, not putting um, different party lines to call in, just oppose and not oppose. This way, people, uh, parties aren't against each other. You're with the president or you aren't with the president. Excellent idea, C-SPAN. I like it. Um, on the president's uh, decision, I'm sure he thought real hard and real long, and and uh, his party's, you know, questioning him now. Uh, but I, I do think he made the right decision. Um, I know he posed the war in Iraq, um, but the fact remains, we're still in Iraq. We're still there maintaining uh, stability. Um, the only thing that bothers me is that, you know, he he doesn't commend the surge in Iraq um, because of Afghanistan as the excuse. But the big thing that I see is how can you mention a pullout <clears throat> on, on war when you have nobody has any idea how long it's going to take, how long the, uh, the commanders of the ground are going to stipulate, um, how we're going to move. And when I look at the time date, it exactly it, it, it exactly exceeds the amount of time one year is in there now. He's going to send troops from about 18 to 24 months uh, that's perfect timing for his re-election running and then some of the troops coming home and him to claim victory. That seems the only reason why he would do that. But I'm very proud of the man making a very tough decision. And thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, Mark, thank you. Uh, there's two points I wish the president had 
stressed more. The first is an emphasis that it really is about al-Qaeda in Pakistan. That's where they are. That's what threatens America. And he did that, but I would have loved more an emphasis upon that. And it might have been for sensitivity to Pakistan. But to your issue, I wish that a definitive timetable to withdraw had not been placed because I don't believe it's as much to do with the central government of Afghanistan and having them step to the plate. We can't put our security in their hands if it's al-Qaeda in Pakistan. What I wish he had done, however, to let everyone know this wasn't an open-ended commitment, was emphasized the part of the speech where he says conditions on the ground will be taken into account. In short, what he, we had heard he would promise, and they actually promised us, the administration, in March was to provide an exit strategy by which we would have benchmarks that measure success and failure. And then the public can know, is the strategy working? And actually, if they can't provide that, how do they know this is the right course? So if they give us that, we would be able, and they would be able to say, it's successful, we're exiting on this timeline. Number two, if it isn't working, it then triggers either an exit to an alternative strategy, one that some call a containment strategy, where you do it from a distance, and then the public can see the cost and benefits. I would prefer that, and in fact, the talking points on the sheet that was given by the White House does say that there will be measurements of progress. To me, that's essential after eight years, rather than a definitive timetable, and I think that would serve the public better, because conditions on the ground about al-Qaeda and getting them are measurements we need more than just the definitiveness of this date we will do X. Lee opposes the president's proposal and calls us from Burlington, North Carolina. Lee? Yes. Go uh -huh. ahead. Hi, Lee. My, my question is, if this war, my question is this. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Lee, go ahead. Okay, my question is this. If this war is about national security, then why are we only sending 30,000 troops? And the answer for that is because the president's heart is not in this war. He does not want to send those 30,000 troops that he's going to send. If he did want to send them, he would have sent them two, three, four weeks ago when the general requested them. Mm. This is a half-cocked plan. It's, it's guaranteed to fail. Lee, thanks for that question, I, and I'm glad to answer this one. The reason I felt that Iraq was such a tragic misadventure, not only because it wasn't a clear danger, but it wasn't a present danger. And people say, listen to the generals. But remember, General McChrystal is responsible for Afghanistan. He's not even responsible for what we're doing in Pakistan. What about the general who's in South Korea today? They, this president, and the reason I respected his deliberate approach, has to take in the whole cloth of our national security by putting more troops in Afghanistan because of the following. For the last four and a half years, there has not been one army unit here at home that can respond to any of the war plans, the entire annex of war plans we have in the Pentagon. For example, several divisions to flow to South Korea to help defend that country and our 27,000 troops there if North Korea were to do what they did in 1950 and attack. This president had to assess what's the impact upon the rest of our security of putting X amount of troops in Afghanistan. He needs to listen to the general there, but he also needs to listen to his collective national security input from around the world. And that's what he did. No, 30,000 troops, I believe, in the way that he then emphasized, we're not just rely upon the central government, but local autonomous governors then gave the proper input to this president to say this is what I believe is needed to be done and that I'm glad he did. You're in a senatorial campaign to unseat uh, Arlen Specter. How is this going to play on the campaign trail? <laughs> Doesn't matter. This is the right decision of what I believe in. I understand I'm in a democratic primary. But there's one thing that I find is lacking in Washington DC is accountable leadership. So many people want to be responsible. But if you want to be accountable, so two months ago I actually put out an op-ed to every one of the 67 counties of Pennsylvania, newspapers, media, what I believed in this, which is essentially what the president's plan is. I said 30 to 35,000, three to five years, we should be there, it will take. I know my opponent has said that we should not do this. But this is a gentleman who I respect, 
But he voted for the tragic misadventure in Iraq that placed Afghanistan in what the chairman of the Joint Staff said, a spiral downward, and permitted, as the head of the CIA said, a safe haven in Pakistan. I'm only concerned about the security of this nation. And how will it play? Pennsylvanians are independent-minded. And I know I'm running both against my own party as well as the Republican, you know. But this is what's needed for this nation, and my job doesn't matter. Representative Sethak, thank you very much for being on the program. Thanks for having me, Rob.